Okay, hello, good morning. Hello, South Hills, and hello, Sunnyvale. It's great to um, be back. Been away on vacation, had a great time. We're in a very sweet season as a family. My son has moved back to town, and my grandbabies are close again, so it's, a, it's been a great time. Thank you for your prayers. And I've got to tell you, last winter, in the middle of all the rain and things like that, the elders, we were having an elders meeting, and the elders asked me, they said, Steve, uh, when was the last time you talked about money? And I was like, wow, I'm not, I'm not sure. And so I started checking around. And so Karina, last night, Karina was here and she was leading worship. I said, she's been on our staff for three years. I said, Karina, you ever heard me talk about money? She said, nope. So I said, well, it's been three years. And then um, Dan Perkins was here last night. He's been on staff for five years. I said, Dan, you ever heard me talk about money? He said, nope. <laughs> so... If you've been here five years or less, you've never heard us talk about money here. And um, right away, right away, I know for some of you, you're like, oh, man, I thought I was glad Steve came back. And now I'm not so sure. <laughs> but let me just kind of tell you, first of all, let me apologize to you, because I believe that's bad leadership. I didn't mean to not talk about it. Obviously, we don't talk about it much here. Um, but it was bad leadership because I know, I know in my life, there are weekly occurrences where I'm having to make tough decisions about finances. And there are great, clear, scriptural guidings for us that I think you should have. And I'm not saying that I'm the only place you ever get that kind of stuff, but I don't want, I don't want to lead a community that doesn't, is not knowledgeable about the, what the scriptures teach. So I think, let me apologize to you first. I know you don't like talking about money. I know there's an aversion to it and everybody in the room's a little eh, puckered up. But just relax, okay? <laughs> Sorry, I should have edited that. That's probably not the correct way to say it, but you know what I mean. So let me, let me do a couple of things to kind of help, hopefully help it relax a little bit. First is this. It's not about getting more. Our, our finances here at Westgate, um, by God's grace and your generosity, are very strong, strongly in the black, as they have been for the 16, now I'm, we're in our 17th year together, and they have been that way throughout. So this is not, if it, at any point in this, you feel welling up in you that I'm trying to get not that you're not supposed to give more. Now, I'm going to leave that between you and God. But if you think I'm trying to get more out of you, that's not what this is about. Let me just tell you right now, we have plenty. I know you won't hear that very often, but that is absolutely true. And if you don't believe me, just flip the budget over and look where we are. It's right there in your bulletin. This is not about trying to get more from you. It's also not about trying to make you feel guilty. I think that the scriptures actually give tremendous freedom around the topic of money, but it requires some work. It requires some work on your behalf. If you've approached your, your usage of money and how you, you know, give it away by just kind of a, a needs-oriented and a a kind of an evaluation of how well things went. Like, for example, if you're in here and the way you normally do the offering is, is that you're just waiting to see how good this is. <laughs> and if you think it's pretty good, you'll think, ah, you know what? Good to have Steve back. That's a $20. Here's 20 And then some of you are going to go, man, money. Sorry I came back. I should have slept in whatever. I ain't giving this week. That, you know, that kind of a response... God is asking more of that from you. Not more money necessarily, maybe even less money, but more thought, more connection with what's going on in the heart. And so I want to I kind of lay out for you what's going on and where we are. And we'll be in a, in a, in a verse in 2 Corinthians 9, one of my favorite passages about money. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, wonderful insight there. So let me pray for us, mostly me, and then we'll jump in. God, thank you for the opportunity to be together. 
without threat, in freedom, in the comfort of this room, to think that you have done such a work that we're actually a campus here and multiple campuses, other places, and that, God, we are still one church. You're teaching us what it means to think of ourselves as your people. We ask that our time together would be blessed by your spirit, that you would teach us that we might understand your will for our lives better, that there might be more of Jesus in us. And that it would not only be for our good, but God, it would be for your glory. So use this time, please. We, we need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. In 2 Corinthians 9, at verse 1, Paul starts out talking to this church in Corinth. It's a second letter to them. We know that he wrote at least three letters to them, but we don't have the third one. It was lost somewhere. But we have two of those three letters, and this is a group of people that were fairly wealthy. The, the, the city of Corinth in the first century, very influential, and uh, lots of resources there. And what he says at the first in, in chapter one is, there's no need for me to write to you about this service. It's the service of giving that he's been talking about in chapter eight. For I know your eagerness to help, and I've been boasting about you to the Macedonians and telling them that since last year that you and Achaia, you, you've already, you're ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. I have to tell you that um, I travel in circles with a lot of different pastors, have the opportunity to, to talk with them, and I always brag on y'all and your generosity and the history of what God is doing here. Let me just say, it's obvious that it's not me. I hadn't talked about money in five years. People ask, what are you doing? Well, I pretty much ignore it, really. Let, that's what, what kind of strategy is that? No, I can't take any credit for this. So God is doing something in us. And I would be much like Paul in uh, chapter nine here. I would be bragging to others about this. So just to give you a context of what's happened um, over the last 16 years now, we're almost to the end of another fiscal year, approximately 47 and a half million dollars have been given here over the last 16 years. That is amazing that a community of people like us could generate that kind of money. Now, just so you know, 13 of that, 13 of that 47, 13 million has been given away. Approximately 27% of the dollars that have been given here have been given away to outside the wall efforts um, in the kingdom. We, we try, we're trying to get that number up to 50, but we just aren't able to quite get it there yet. We'd love to give away 50% of what, of what comes in. But over the last 16 years, it's been a number 27%. Well done. Thank you. Those of you that have been a part of that, even, whatever, at whatever level, don't, don't be sitting there going, oh, I hardly give anything. Whatever you, at whatever level, thank you for your generosity. But when you hear those numbers, I don't, I don't want you to hear... Um, just dollar signs. I want you to know that as collectively as a community, we have committed ourselves to make constant, regular exertions into a lifestyle of generosity. We didn't set out saying, I wonder if we could give away, you know, 13 million. We, that was never in our dreams. The first year we gave away like $25,000 maybe or something. We've never in our dreams to do something like this. It's just been a constant, regular exertion towards a lifestyle of generosity. And when you hear those numbers, what I want you to see in your mind is this. Let me introduce you to Helen. This is Helen. We met Helen almost 15 years ago. 15 years ago, Helen was a seven, eight-year-old girl in Harare, Zimbabwe. Both of her parents were dead from AIDS. And collectively here together, this was our first big effort towards anything overseas. We said, we wanna do something for children that somewhere in the world that are really bad off and Harare was like spot one or two. I mean, so we had Helen come along. This is her today. And then Pamela, Pamela was also one of those girls that in that very first group, seven, eight-year-old girls that were wandering the streets just trying to survive on their own. Can you imagine a seven-year-old girl on her own in the streets of Harare? 
You know where that's heading, right? I mean, if you don't, it's, it's not good. And by God's grace, this last May, Helen and Pamela graduated from the university in Harare, Zimbabwe. We started out, we started out with 15 girls. Now, not all the girls went to university. Some of the girls um, graduated from school and then they got a jobs and they've married and have families. Others went to trade school. But along the way, we've journeyed with them. Your generosity has allowed us to journey with them through this whole deal. And we helped these two girls go to the university and get a degree. And so they send greetings. Here's a few of the girls in the home that we bought in Zimbabwe, which, by the way, is called the Westgate House of Hope. And it's in a community of people that's actually called Westgate. It's crazy <laughs> the way God works. And here's their greeting to you. Take a look. Jesu, Jesu, Baba. So when you hear these numbers, here is the truth of it. And this is, I am not bragging. I'm telling you what God is doing through you this morning. Thousands of children, thousands of children were housed, clothed, and given the resources so that they could lead a normal, protected life in a community of love. Thousands. This morning, thousands of women had access to clean water so that they don't have to spend their whole Sunday fetching water on their head. What? It's not just about a budget. I hope you can see that and feel that, that we have a responsibility to our world. That I, regardless of where you are in this, and I know we've got folks that are, that they're out of money and they still month left. I get it. And then there's people in here with great resources. But for the most part, generally speaking, here and at our campuses, we are the haves. And because of your generosity, it's making a difference in thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. Now, this lays out for us, this passage will lay out for us. He will introduce us to a principle of how to view finances. He will give us a practice or a procedure of how to manage those and work them out and then closes with the great promise. Let me introduce you to it. First is the principle. The principle is this, verse six. Remember, whoever sows sparingly, and that word there can mean stingy, it's the thought of uncertain affinity. It's the idea of withholding what is due. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously, this is a cool word. It's a compound word. If I were going to translate it today, I'd call it supersized. <laughs> it's like you could have had a medium drink, but instead you got a big gulp which is way more caffeine than you'll ever need in one day. If you sow generously, if you sow, sow supersized, you will also reap supersized. Now, this is explained in the scriptures. Luke 6, Jesus says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be poured into your lap. For Watch this. For the measure you use will be the measure you receive. Now, some of you might say, ah, man, that's kind of rigid of God. But actually, it's just being smart. If I'm God, which I know takes a great amount of imagination, and I'm looking down on this front row, and I say, you know, I'm going to give some stuff to y'all. And I say, but you first three people, y'all are stingy. Sorry. Sorry. And the next three people, y'all are generous. Where? Yeah. He's, he's humble, too. Where am I going to give my resources? Because God's blessing towards us 
or certainly for us personally, but they are, they are supposed to be things that are on the way to someone else as we receive them. Never supposed to just stay right with us. It's supposed to be a river that flows right out of us. We receive the grace and the blessing that we have and it just flows to a person. And God says, by the measure you use, that's going to be the measure that I use against you. It's illustrated in nature. John 12, Jesus says, I tell you a solemn truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. This is the law of the harvest. It's applied to us in Luke 9. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will gain it. For what does it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but loses and forfeits himself? See, it's a mindset. It's a mindset that there's an opportunity for us to be a part of something that, that is beyond us. This law of the harvest. Most beautifully, it is applied to Jesus who generously and willingly set aside the glory of heaven uh, for our behalf. In Luke, in, in Philippians chapter two, it's kind of described this way. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And as a result, God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what I want to do now is I want to give you kind of a theology of money. Just an overview. If you were to just kind of do a topical study, you would come up with these six or so observations about what the scriptures consistently teach from beginning to end about money. And hopefully as I'm doing this, it'll add, it'll add to this whole principle of the law of the harvest. So this is what the scriptures say. First, earn money ethically. Now that should be like a duh. But the truth of the matter is, is that the Lord, Proverbs 11, the Lord hates cheating and he delights in honesty. And in, in our vocations, our earning of money, that, that we are known as honest workers. And we don't, Say more than we can do. We don't promise more than will happen. We show up when we say. We charge what we said. We don't take things home, even small things. You earn your money ethically. Secondly, you spend your money wisely. Proverbs 21, I love this verse. Plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. It, this needs to speak, spending money wisely. What kind of spender are you? My wife, listen, if she says we ought to buy it, that means she's researched it, she's priced it, she's looked at the reviews, she understands what we ought to do it, that we can afford it with our budget and we should get it. When she says buy it, that means buy it. <laughs> okay, when I say let's buy it, <laughs> that means that I got a cool little feeling going on somewhere in here that I think that would be nice to have. And there's, you've got to understand that that's a poor way to shop. And you can get yourself in gigantic amounts of trouble if you and the rest of the people in the home are all feeling like me. You need to slow yourself down and to spend money wisely. Luke 16, 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever can't be trusted with little, cannot be trusted with much. Thirdly, avoid destructive debt. Romans 13, 
It says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Proverbs 22, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, let me kind of put this in perspective for us. Listen to me now for a little bit. Don't, I know some of you got debt and you understand what destructive debt is about, but just let me give it to you in a way that we can kind of put it in our group here. The average American has $8,300 worth of credit card debt. Okay? The average American lives on a, over 100% of what they make every year too. So if 8,300 bucks worth of credit card debt were implied just to us as a community, let's say we're approximately 3,000 adults, 3,000 adults with $8,300 of credit card debt per is 24 million bucks plus. With the going credit card rate at about 20%, that is $5 million of credit card debt paid out of just us as a community per year. Now, I know some of you are saying, I don't have any credit card debt. And it's all you can do just not to jump up and shout it. <laughs> so let me do it for you. I don't either. That means some of y'all got a whole lot of credit card debt because it averages out to 8,300 bucks. I don't care where you are. That's destructive. That's destructive debt. I'm not saying that all debt is destructive. There are some very good uses of debt. But credit cards are not one of them. You see, this whole talk about money is not just about money. It's about faith. It's about patience. It's about discipline in our lives. Avoid destructive debt. Next, save money consistently for your future. Love this verse, Proverbs 6, beginning at verse 6. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. <laughs> Learn from their ways and be wise. Even though they have no prince, no governor, no ruler, to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering for the winter. Again, the same thing, just saving consistently. Now, let me just say, well, I'll get to it in a minute. Next, give money to the poor generously. Proverbs 19, verse 17, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Wow. Proverbs 11, a generous man will prosper and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And then finally, tithe to the house of God to support God's ministry. Now, this is going to be, let's, get, let's do something controversial. First, let me use a verse completely out of context. <laughs> because I believe there's a principle from it, although it doesn't have direct applications for us. Malachi 3 is to a particular audience, but it says in Malachi 3, should people cheat God? God says, but you have cheated me. But you ask, how did, what do you mean? How did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. And it goes on to say, if you'll just try me, if you'll trust me, you'll find that I'm faithful to, to you know, provide for you. Now, the reason I think that, here's how this is not as applicational for us, because tithing as a strict 10% rule is not taught in the New Testament. Okay, so I know I'm blowing some of y'all out and you're just like, you can disagree with me, but I don't believe tithing is taught for us in the New Testament. The Old Testament, actually, if we're gonna go with those words, the Old Testament has three tithes, which equal about 22% of the income, and they were mandatory because it was a theocracy. It was a God-centered government and they were, it was part of a tax, if you will, to kind of be a part of it. But tithing puts the wrong emphasis on giving. To just have a strict rule of 10% turns it into a rule to follow that's too harsh for some and too lenient for others. 
Tithing also kind of lends a wrong concept about how you think about money because what you'll think is, well, 10% is God's and 90% is mine. When the teachings of the scripture say 100% of everything you have is God's. See, tithing's too easy. That's just too easy. Now you're thinking, oh man, are you kidding? How do you, how do you figure that out then? What are you saying? I, it's, it's just too easy to say, here's 10%, because anybody can do that division. Even if you're bad at math, you know 10% of X. It's easy. You just move a decimal point and bam, Right? And God says it's way harder than that. And we, we are introduced to it in a process or a practice or a procedure in verse 7. Here it is. Each person, man or woman, should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now let's just work our way through that. It, what you have decided in advance to give, it should be thoughtful. The, the word here is actually to weigh anchor. It's to prepare, think it through, weigh anchor, and go on a journey. It's not just to kind of tip and respond to a need here and there. It's to have been thoughtful. He also says that we should be generous. Decided that we should give generously. Um, this... Or, or, and not reluctantly. Reluctantly here has the idea of unhappiness that's marked with regret. Like, you know, you, you get all fired up and you say, well, that was a good sermon, 20 bucks. And before the basket's to the end of the aisle, you're like, ah! <laughs> I will, ah! What was I thinking? There's no way that dude's worth 20 bucks. <laughs> so that's reluctant giving. Listen, you're not helping us. If you give money and then you pat yourself on the back, but you're pissed off about it. That's not helping you. It's not helping us. God doesn't need your money that much. It's thoughtful. It's generous. It's voluntary. 2 Corinthians 8, 12. Listen to this verse. This is an amazing verse. It says, it's in the chapter right before where we are. If the willingness is there for the giving... If the willingness to give is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you're hard pressed, but that there might be equality. It's, it's not equal gifts. It's not an equal percentage. There are some people in the room and we don't want to identify you and we don't, we don't want to embarrass you, but there, you can't give a, a 10% Gift is just not going to work in your budget. The pressures of where you live, the pressures of being in the Silicon Valley, the pressures of bad decisions, whatever it is, the pressures of student loans. Some of you cannot, nor should you, give 10%. Now, did you hear that? I want to say it clearly. Now, the problem with me making that statement is there are others in the room that shouldn't give 10% either. You should probably give 20%. And you're like, oh, that can't be me. I'm in the first group. <laughs> you see, Tim, just having a 10% rule for everybody is just too easy. What God would like for you to do is sit down and determine what would it look like to give cheerfully. That's the last part of this verse. For God loves a cheerful giver. This word here is where we get our word hilarious. Many years ago, we decided to cheer at the offering. We thought we, we ought to do something that exhibits a joy as we're being able to give. We wanted to do this. We wanted for you to take the basket and when you took the basket, to giggle. <laughs> and then just hand it on down. And just have it just go all across. I mean, thought that'd be so fun. But it's just a little weird, right? I mean, and some of you, and some of y'all wouldn't do it. We know. You're way too cool to giggle. So we thought maybe we'd cheer instead. But the, the idea is that the, the, it's, it should be something that you're doing cheerfully. Now, how do you get to this? You, you thoughtfully decide, how can I balance sacrifice and joy? 
You see, here's the deal. If you don't already have a number about what you're gonna give later in the offering today, please don't give. Don't give today. Don't give. Go home and over the next few weeks, not alone, if you're, if you're married, don't make that decision alone, but in community, how do, we back, how do we balance sacrifice and joy? Now, let me just tell you in my own life, there was a time in my life when I thought God would be impressed that I gave a certain percentage of my income away. And it was wrong for me to do. It was a number that was way too big. It put a lot of pressure on my wife, who's balancing the budget most of the time in our home for obvious reasons. <laughs> and it put pressure on my kids. It just, it just wasn't right for me to do. And it was, it was pride. I had a lot of sacrifice. The sacrifice was really heavy in my life and joy wasn't much. Wasn't much at all. So in typical Clifford fashion, I reacted. Boop. And I gave very little, which made me pretty happy. But there was way too much joy and not much sacrifice. Now I can't get you there. You see why, does it, does it, you see why 10% is just too easy? Generally, 10% is looked at as a starting point. I'm not gonna say that, but for some people, maybe. But you've gotta do the hard work of saying, this is what we have. Here's what we can give, not reluctantly, but cheerfully balancing joy and sacrifice. Joy, biblical giving is when joy and sacrifice walk hand in hand. And then there's a promise. Verse eight. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. If you write in your Bible and you've got one with you, you might just circle all and every. Let me read it to you again. God is able to make grace abound to you, all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now, the way I read that scripture, it seems to me that God could actually handle the housing market of the Silicon Valley. See, I say goodbye to a family almost every week here. And the reason they're leaving is housing. Now, I want to suggest to you that there's a promise to claim and that some of you that are considering leaving, I, can't, I don't know whether it's God's will or not, but I know that if you make that decision just based on what size house you can have, that you've, you've miscalculated the provision of God. And you've also overclaimed his promises. I can't find a verse. Listen, when, we first, when Dana and I first got into the ministry, we were, we were homeowners and we took a job at a church to help a buddy, pretty good cut and pay. And we rented for the next 14 years. And I looked like crazy to find a verse that says, if you follow Jesus, you get to own a home. <laughs> I mean, I looked, man, I was looking for that. And I couldn't find one. I found one that said, if you'll follow Jesus, you will have all you need. And this is where money gets back to. This is why it's so important. This is why I'm, it was bad leadership on my part to go five years and not talk about it. Because this, it is the most practical in your face measurement for how your faith is doing in your life. That there is. Jesus said so. There, you want to know where your heart is? Where's your treasure? Where is your treasure? Later on, we won't get this far in 2 Corinthians 9, but at verse 11, it said, says that if you'll do these things, Paul writes, you will be made rich in every way. Somebody ought to yell, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Watch, so that, purpose statement, why will God bless you? So that you can be 
generous. I wrote across the top of my Bible, right up here on 2 Corinthians 9, I said the challenge to embark on the noble cause of a life of generosity. You see, I, I don't know how much you've got. I don't want to know. I don't look at the giving records here. I don't trust myself with that information. But I know this. A hallmark of God's people throughout the centuries has been generosity. And the only generous people are people of faith, of great faith, that decide intentionally to open their hands and give away things that are dear to you. Now, I'd like for you, to invite you to come back next week. We're going to talk about money again, which means probably nobody's going to be here. <laughs> but what I'd like to talk to you about next week is how to be rich. Not how to get rich. I don't know anything about that. How to be rich. Let's pray. God, we thank you that this calling of generosity in our lives has been modeled so well by you. Your love is, 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 has expressed the generous gift of Christ and so many good things around us. That as your children, you long for us to trust you with things that we don't have and things that we don't want to give away so that we can also model the kind of generous spirit that you have. We ask, God, that you would give us the faith to do the hard work beyond just a simple number that lets us off the hook, that we would do the hard work of balancing joy and sacrifice. Not so that we'll be blessed, not so that we'll have an abundance, but so that you would be glorified and we would look more like Jesus as we live. Thank you, God. Thank you so much for the blessings you have placed on this community of people. We give you all of the credit, all of the glory. It's clearly of you. And we thank you for the privilege of being a part of that generous effort. Help us to stay faithful. Have your way with us. In Jesus' name.